Welcome to the Archives of Information Technology, where we capture the past and inspire the future. It's the 21st of June, 2018, and that's a significant date because 70 years ago today, one of the very first store program computers ran its first program. It was at Manchester University. We're in the headquarters of the Royal Society in central London. My name's Richard Sharp, and I've been covering information technology since the early 1970s. And we're in the Royal Society because treasurer currently of the Royal Society is Professor Dr. Andrew Hopper, CBE. Uh, Dr. Andrew Hopper um, co-founded so many companies that he is one of these very important people who branch between the academic world and the industrial world. Professor Hopper, you were born in Poland in 1953, on May the 9th. You're Polish. <laughs> yes, I'm fully Polish. Both parents Polish, uh, born and uh, went to school there. But uh, my parents uh, separated and my mo mother uh, met and married an English uh, person, uh, William Hopper. Uh, so he adopted me. Uh, we came to the UK in 1964 when I was uh, just 11, thereabouts, um, and since then I've lived in the UK. But uh, culturally, I'm uh, Polish, and uh, you know I can eat a sausage faster than most people uh, near to us. So, uh, so there is some deep Polish culture there, and I'm fully fluent in Polish still to this day. You have um, a scientific background. Did your parents have a scientific background, and did your stepfather have a scientific background? No, not uh, particularly, but uh, cultures of engineering in the broad uh, do vary considerably by country. And in the Polish culture, uh, and I even remember this today, uh, even at that uh, early age, uh, engineering in the broadest sense, and at that time it wasn't so much computer engineering, was uh, a high-value item, so to speak, uh, in terms of prestige, esteem, earning power, and sort of societal uh, commentary. So uh, it was more that sort of thing rather than uh, some immediate family background. When you came to the UK, how did you integrate into the UK? You still you had English um, as a second language, did you, by then? No, I had Russian as a second language. Russian. <laughs> I didn't speak a word of English when I came to this country. Um, in, at the time, I thought I had no problems at all, uh, and I was completely happy, and so on and so forth. But in retrospect, uh, actually, uh, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, it took me uh, a little while to sort of properly uh, get going, and perhaps the cultural and the language uh, change was uh, part of it. I have no idea. Did you have to sit the 11 plus? Uh, I just came at a time when the 11 plus would have been sat, but because I can speak English, I didn't take it, and thereby I was excluded for a whole bunch of schools because not taking it was the same as not getting it, and uh, that was one of the barriers to uh, my education in this country. So how were you educated in secondary education? Well, all the sort of bigger schools, uh, my stepfather uh, could afford uh, a private education, but places like... Uh, Westminster School, Latimer School said nothing doing, not interested in you. Uh, so all those interviews failed. Uh, and eventually he, uh, I'm not quite sure how, but uh, managed to convince a headmaster uh, in a uh, grammar school in uh, St. John's Wood called Quintin School uh, to accept me, and that's where I went. This was uh, a little bit of a thing because we lived in Putney, so I had an hour commute every day to school uh, each way uh, to go to this particular uh, school called Quinton School. Did you enjoy it? Uh, yes, I mean, you know, I, uh, it was socially very mixed. Uh, uh, it became a comprehensive school uh, when I joined the sixth form there. It merged with the secondary modern school, which was... Uh, Adjacent, actually in the same style of buildings, it's just there was a kind of artificial partition into the two types of school that was uh, uh, removed and uh, it became one. So the social mix uh, at all times, actually, but even uh, in particular uh, during the lower sixth and upper sixth was very good. And I was uh, 
London's a great place now, and it was a great place then. So, uh, uh, living in London and uh, uh, enjoying uh, what it has to offer, even at the simple level of a, of a young person at, at school, was great. So, I, I don't, I have just great memories. But looking back on it, uh, let me put it this way: my uh, achievements, performance, ability to do stuff wasn't. Uh, I wasn't as effective at that time. I was rather more effective uh, for whatever reason, but perhaps education uh, or well, language or something has got to do it later on. What were your favourite subjects? Uh, well, I've always uh, liked uh, physical, tangible things. So, uh, uh, you know, the physical sciences uh, did interest me. Um, uh, so, on the positive side, uh, uh, Certainly, uh, physics, uh, electronics, in the sense of uh, within that subject and doing some hobby stuff at home. The other way, I was excluded from the biological sciences because of my performance, so I didn't really do biology at, at that school. Um, and uh, 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 my focus was uh, much more on, on, on the sort of physical stuff. On the languages and so on, I was okay, but since English was not my language, it took two or three years to become fluent, or more fluent. I'm not sure I'm completely fluent today. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't really get tremendous uh, traction. I did all right, I have no complaints, everything's fine, but in retrospect, I, I, I was at the bottom of the class. Uh, in those days, you'd be you know, in the list. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Having been, uh, you know, uh, done very well in the Polish schooling system, where I was you know, all right. Uh, in retrospect, I went way down. However, at the time, I was completely happy, and I've got no complaints. I wouldn't change anything, so you know, it's nothing, no, no, no overtone of any kind. But uh, I, uh, 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 I think the third year of secondary school of this grammar school was uh, my worst then I sort of slightly picked up for uh, O levels uh, and then at A levels the lowest thing was probably actually another low point uh, I remember uh, the sort of careers people recommending that uh, I'm not suitable for university uh, uh, that I should do what at that time was called a, a national diploma a high national diploma go into uh, that sort of uh, line of work so uh, uh, parents uh, even you know, went out to some sort of psychology types or something, I can't quite remember, but anyway, they scored me as well and also said, mm, I'm not sure about this, well that was a lot of nonsense, but um, uh, I, I kind of picked up towards the uh, upper sixth, but only got medium grades, so I ended up, uh, as it turns out, was fabulous, fantastic, but going to Swansea because of my grades didn't quite make Manchester uh, 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 didn't make the offer uh, there, um, so Swansea was the place I ended up at. And what did you read? Well, it's fantastic. I read computer technology. So imagine, in 1971, this university, Swansea, put on a course which they called computer technology and contained the following two major and one smaller item. The major were computer science and electronics, electrical engineering, but on the lighter side. And the minor thing was economics and accountancy. Fast forward to 2018, today, that's, you know, computer science is big, and uh, all the enterprise stuff today, well, it was in that course. What did I say? Accountancy and economics, right? So, as an undergraduate, in your first year, getting some underpinnings in how to do a balance sheet and sort of some vague idea of marginal cost, marginal revenue pricing and stuff like that as a minor part of this computer technology course was fantastic. So, so it's just because, you know, it's particularly, I love it, I'm professor of computer technology at Cambridge University. The department is called, in Cambridge, Department of Computer Science and Technology. And in 1971, they were bright enough in Swansea, it was a person called David Aspinall, who was from Manchester and had gone to Swansea for his first chair. He was at Humist, actually. 
um, had the foresight, the nurse, whatever it was, to put together a course which, uh, you know, as I say, I'm just I think it was amazing and uh, it was right on the money, both intellectually and financially. Do you think it is important that you are from Poland and that Hermann Hauser was from Austria and that you both succeeded in this country? Well, it's very important. Uh, uh, one doesn't really know the reasons uh, why and it's, you know, it's a, probably some complex and uh, subtle in many ways uh, uh, reason but it's not uh, you know, my gut feeling to answer your question it's not because we're immigrants and want to succeed maybe there's a little bit of that but uh, we're outside the local culture to some extent so we don't see some of the barriers we're not quite so embarrassed uh, uh, because if we uh, you know, say something silly uh, they're different uh, it's not in, in, in band of the local culture Maybe, I don't know, I can be embarrassed plenty, but you see what I mean? It's, it's uh, uh, trying things in a slightly more unrestricted uh, way uh, is probably more important than the, oh, I better make it good because I'm an immigrant, so, uh, you know, I'm going to try harder. Uh, certainly doesn't apply to me. Uh, on that. You succeeded at Swansea. What else did you like apart from your studies of being at a British university? Uh, well, uh, uh, it's a beautiful place, so I spent as much time having fun as uh, working hard. I did work hard, uh, and that's where I... Uh, I mean, for the, for the paradox for me is that uh, I didn't do so well in A-level, but from the first term uh, at Swansea, I did very, very well. Thereafter, it was, you know, everything was amazing. So, obviously, there was a fit opportunity and whatever... So I did that, but party, party, party. Come on, this was the early 70s, so uh, beaches, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I really enjoyed uh, 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 that aspect uh, of it. And uh, even then, as today, it's not that far away on the train or by car, so I would come back to my... It was provincial uh, compared to London, so, you know, we're in the west of what we're... Uh, St. James is here, um, the West End of London. Uh, I was very familiar with uh, everything around here when I was 18 years old, 17 years old, 16 years old. I mean, very, very, used to go to clubs and all that stuff. So Swansea, in relation to that, was provincial. So I would come back here and meet my school friends, uh, some of whom I have contact with to this day. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd be doing the latest, greatest, fun thing, whatever that was. And then I'd go to Swansea, which was a little more provincial, but very, uh, uh, very interesting. But I also did a lot of travel. Always liked travel. So uh, in the holidays, uh, uh, between the first and second year, with one of my school friends, we got a car. Uh, imagine uh, 19 years old, and we drove from here to Tehran in Iran, and then came back. He was an Iranian fella. Uh, so we spent a month or two. Uh, yeah, six weeks or something with, with uh, his family there but just imagine 19 years old driving all the way down to Istanbul actually put the car on a boat across the Black Sea ship and then drove the rest of the way and then to some extent around Iran and then back so that was between the first and second year and between the second and third year I got myself off to Brazil for the summer and got on a bus and went up to the Amazon, uh, map of the Amazon, a place called Belém, and up a ship to uh, the jungles, Manaus, in central uh, Amazonas, and back down, and so on. So, you know, uh, just by myself. So, uh, it wasn't just uh, Swansea and provincial, but actually uh, some fairly significant uh, travel, and I continue uh, traveling. To this day, uh, uh, in uh, all kinds of weird and wonderful ways, sometimes at the fancy and sometimes at the uh, uh, rather more basic end. I like both. You're also a pilot, aren't you? Yeah, so that's... that's Over 6,000 hours? Yeah. And so you have a, your own plane? My own plane, I've got my own airstrip. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm a flying nut, and the most adventurous thing I've done, which isn't meant to be adventurous, but is round the world. 
but I've actually done around Africa, around South America, around North America, around the world, around Australia, around New Zealand, uh, all that stuff. Uh, so you get in the plane, it's only a small plane, you press the button, you have a little snooze, wake up 15 hours later and you're somewhere else, you know, so it's great. <laughs> but you have to pilot it. Oh, yeah, well, you, know, you press the button and there we go. <laughs> what do you enjoy about flying? Well, it's the adventure flying, so uh, it's a little bit like uh, that uh, business of uh, two round and back in the car and round... Um, Brazil, it was in South America, specifically Brazil, on the buses, um, on the dirt roads as, as was then. Uh, so uh, it's adventure flying, and when I say adventure flying, here is the executive summary. One, of course you travel from A to B, and even with a smallish plane, you know, you can, you can go reasonably far uh, uh, in a few hours. That's 200 miles an hour, so if, you know, if you're doing... Uh, Five hours, ten, ten, you can't do ten hours, but say five hours, well, that's a thousand miles, so you know, that's a reasonable distance. So that's one, you travel. Uh, and in my case, it's flying down the valleys and, you know, it's going down the beach. So, for example, uh, I went from uh, Angola along the beach to Cape Town at 50 feet all the way. You know? It's a big distance, so it's, you, you're looking at watching, following rivers, whatever. Uh, so it's adventure in that sense, it's travel and visual. Then that, when you land somewhere, most people speak uh, enough English, uh, they might be just caretakers of the... Because the plane is small, you can go to small airstrips, you can go to the big ones for the bureaucracy, but you can go to small ones, so you end up... And you've got, basically they say, what the hell are you doing here? And you say, what the hell are you doing here? Because I'm back of the yard. But they speak enough English that you can communicate. So, and, and typically these places are quiet. So it's mutually uh, entertaining. But then you've got an engagement with a local who says, well, try this, try that. Or what's it like in Cambridge or, you know, whatever. And they're people of the world, so it's not sort of... Yeah, things like that. Uh, so that's the uh, 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 second uh, 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 part of it. Uh, you engage with, with the people. And of course, then if you follow on from their advice about what to do next, you have enough flexibility in what you're doing. It's not a tour you've bought and you know, you're following a schedule. Even a fancy tour uh, has a schedule. Um, uh, you keep on adapting uh, to some extent. And so all kinds of interesting new things come along as a consequence of that. So it's all those things. It's the physical travel, it's the easy entry to the local scene because you're dealing with somebody who's talking planes uh, to you, and then the advice and the broader uh, cultural thing, by that I mean how is it to live in this place, uh, uh, what do people do, what's the education like, you know, all that sort of stuff which I personally uh, enjoy and you can, uh, you know, and you're right into it. So it's, that's my form of travel. What I don't do is business travel. I don't get in my plane, fly off because I've got a meeting. Forget all that. Maybe I'm going too far here, but there's an analogy with modern computing networking in the way you like to fly, which is it's not a predestined route, it's not set out like an old PTT would set out a telephone line and allocate trunk space to it and allocate the other, the last mile going to, this, going to whoever you're phoning up. You go from place to place and you see what is the best place to go next. It, it's rather like a, a ring or isn't it? Yeah, there's some analogy uh, uh, there. I mean, you end up getting somewhere and it's all engineered. So this is an adventure flying in the sense of risk-taking, not at all. I do the opposite. It's very... Assessed and, and done in a, you know, in other words, you've got enough experience, way, way, way more experience that is necessary to do the next thing that you're going to do, whether that's high flying, low flying, you know, bad weather, good weather, night, whatever it is. Um, uh, so in that sense, it's uh, uh, um, like a network, if you like. Things eventually get there, and it's reliable enough, and so on. But the path you take and how it ends up take going, and what the delay is, so to speak and the way you might stop, so to speak, to retransmit or the equivalent of retransmission, or at least having a buffer, 
uh, which fills up and you say, oh, I'm going to hang around here because I've just met somebody who's really interesting and he or she have invited me for dinner. So, yeah, some similarity there. When did you meet your first computer? Well, uh, it was really at Swansea because the other... Uh, 1971 was when I started, which is when the microprocessor was first essentially available. Uh, so Intel, uh, 4004 but 8008, and hence uh, the course, I think, was partially inspired by the fact that you could give people something to play with. And so uh, in 1971, when I first arrived, uh, the university had uh, uh, one of the uh, ICL 1900 or whatever it was, in other words, behind a big cabinet and you couldn't really get at it, it was in the first term. And then uh, fairly quickly that first year they said, oh, here is a bit of a board with prototype, see if you can you know, make the blinking light flash or whatever. Today it's called Raspberry Pi, and that time it was called um, uh, uh, you know, Intel 8008. So that's when I really uh, uh, got the idea of... Uh, let me tell you a funny story. I mean, it's not funny, but it's an anecdote that I remember now. So to go for my interview in Manchester in 1971, I was reading a computer journal, and it was, I was trying to figure out the difference between hardware and software, okay? So, so as an upper sixth form student, age 17, I still hadn't had enough education to understand the difference. I remember doing it on the train, like, they might ask you something, I understand a little bit more about this. And that's because I hadn't had any hands-on experience. And, of course, as soon as you do... That, that, that becomes obvious and, and all that is so on and, and uh, so that was my first uh, uh, computer and, and actually uh, uh, my project uh, in, in the uh, third year which was 73-74 was to reprogram a four processor piece of hardware which had been constructed uh, as a research project uh, by uh, Professor Aspinall uh, and his postdocs um, uh, so I also got a little bit of exposure to, you know, slightly more complex systems and whatever, and parallel processing and uh, so on, and then how to, um, um, uh, it wasn't networking, but how to have them working together into the memory system and all this sort of stuff. So, fantastic, I'm just thinking about it, fantastic. As soon as the microprocessor comes along, they plonk it in front of these students, me and others, they let us get our hands on, we get our hands dirty, get a good feel for it, ah, marvellous. And then you moved to Cambridge to do a PhD. Yeah, and that was an interesting uh, little, uh, you know, how does life turn out? I've no idea. I, I'm not a sort of uh, person who has everything planned. I grabbed my opportunities, all right, uh, mainly, you know, through enthusiasm. Um, to some extent, I learned that you mentioned Herman Hauser. You know, he's a, one of my best buddies, business partner, almost kind of, I'm almost, he sometimes calls me his little brother. Uh, uh, and his enthusiasm infects me, right? Has infected me, you know, from when we were at Cambridge uh, as PhD students. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I ended up in Cambridge. But it wasn't this, so. So I, I'm, I'm still to this day, and I certainly was then sporty. So I like to sporty, sporty. And uh, uh, the sporty that I had in me, funnily enough, was skiing. Okay, I know you can't do skiing in in. Uh, London, so we used to go on ski trips, but I had done some skiing in Poland when I was a kid, because you could send, uh, you know, as part of the old communist system, there were sort of establishments, families could send their kids to, and I was sent on, on, on uh, that sort of uh, uh, thing. I can't remember exactly which establishment, but I, I, you know, I was an okay skier even when I came to this country, then some ski trips, and then in Swansea, but in Swansea, uh, no can do, so a little bit of... Uh, 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 going on trips and then you know there's a sort of uh, what was at that time maybe it carries on to this day a British University ski competition in Aviemore so go up there and do a little bit of racing and all this sort of stuff but you know it's um, slightly underplayed and uh, I'm not the great skier but I'm not bad so I actually wanted to do my PhD uh, in the Alps I thought, oh, I get a bit of skiing, I get a PhD. So I applied both to EPFL uh, and to Grenoble University. And both at that time were uh, uh, 
established in computing and uh, EPNL was EPN, Ecole Polytechnique Federale Lausanne EPFL oh, okay. Lausanne so one of the two there's ETH and EPFL in uh, Lausanne ETH is in Zurich and then University of uh, Grenoble um, so I'm an undergraduate exams coming up I send off my stuff nothing happens no response no reply oh a bit sad oh dear um, so uh, I get my results I do well and uh, you mentioned in the introduction about the banter uh, between Manchester and uh, Cambridge about who did the first computer well actually both did in their own way everybody's claim on the first computer is true not just ours those two but there are others and they're all true because they're all slightly different but uh, David Aspinall, Professor Aspinall at Swansea, knew uh, people at Cambridge uh, because the banter is, is not competitive in a bad sense. It's, you know, it's, it's good stuff in its own way. So I said, what shall I do? I've got a good result. I've applied over there. He says, go and see David Wheeler in Cambridge. So uh, it was very late on, after the exams, so... Uh, we're end of June, so it would have been around this sort of time, maybe even uh, slightly another week or two forward from, from today, but in 1974. Uh, off I go to Cambridge, uh, saying, David Aspinall sent me, uh, you know, I'm interested in a PhD. So they say, yeah, yeah, come along, we'll interview you. So I, I go up to Cambridge, and I am interviewed uh, uh, not particularly by uh, uh, David Wheeler, uh, but by Maurice Wilkes and Roger Needham. Uh, and uh, did you know who they were? No, I just, I, you know, Cambridge, a great brand. I, David Wheeler was the specific uh, mm. person who ended up being my PhD supervisor. But uh, 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 no, I, uh, I do nothing. Cambridge was one of these places where I couldn't have possibly got into it. What am I doing here? And it's flat. There's no skiing, right? I mean, <laughs> what's going on here, right? But they gave me an interview, and very quickly they said, yes, you're in, and we've got a studentship. So I thought, my word, that's really good. And, and the deadline was very close, so I actually hand-carried the so I drove to Swansea and back to Cambridge and back to Swansea back to Cambridge to get all the paperwork in place so that they could award by the deadline. I guess that must have been end of July uh, by, by then so that uh, I could have the grant and the, uh, and, and the place. So that turned out very well. But subsequently, uh, you know, uh, many years later, I was the one interviewing and running the admissions program and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I twigged that what happened, they had somebody drop out. Okay, and I turned up. So of course they said, well, "He's good. He's all right." But if we don't make an offer right now, we're going to lose the studentship. So you're in. <laughs> so, no, no, yeah. really. It was because you were so good. Okay. Well, I wish it was true, but you know, it's not completely true. What did you choose to study in your PhD? Uh, well, you see, the other, th uh, you know. Talent is important, but many people have talent. A bit of good fortune and contribution of the right thing at the right time um, is important. So I had come from a course which enabled me to build a bit of hardware and then put up some firmware software and a little bit of an application on top. But it's the first bit. I knew how to use a soldering iron and I knew what the TI catalog was with the uh, with all the 7,400 uh, chips inside it. And uh, at Cambridge, they had just completed building the cap machine um, and weren't building too much. The Cambridge ring was only just getting going. And I turned up as a person who says, oh, I like a bit of uh, uh, hardware construction, design construction. Um, so they welcomed me because also, for, you know, from a, not just the grant was going to be lost, but also what I said I'd like to do uh, was uh, in line with just the lie of the land uh, as it turned out uh, at the department. So when I arrived, uh, they, uh, uh, they, Morris Wilkes was the head of the department then, 
uh, I was allocated a space not just in the PhD students' room, shared, shared laboratory, and I shared that room with interesting people, uh, but they gave me some lab space, meaning with the technicians and engineers who had built the cap and had been involved in EDSAC too, and they gave me a, a, a bench up there, and I started building little bits of hardware, and they were very happy there was somebody up there, and equally it was a little unusual for uh, a PhD student to be sitting with that uh, uh, engineering group and support group, but that meant I got to know them quite well. So later on, when I uh, helped out with the Cambridge Ring uh, design, where those people were building it, and uh, David Wheeler had designed a lot of it, Morris uh, Wilkes uh, had uh, the conceptual uh, uh, thoughts about it, uh, uh, Roger Needham did the distributed system around it, I wore short trousers and helped out with little bits and pieces, but nevertheless those little bits and pieces did uh, help with the construction. It was in the bosom of the engineering and technology, uh, techn technical team, uh, and then I could also do my PhD, uh, as a, uh, which was to design a VLSI version of the Cambridge Ring and other local Great. area networks. Uh, but you see how it all fitted nicely. I, I fell into a uh, very embracing situation uh, from a support point of view, I fell into a situation where strategically they were looking for the next thing to do, which turned out to be the Cambridge Ring, or had just started it. Uh, and my background uh, was such that I was, you know, a, a, a good fit. So I didn't decide to do subject X, Y, or Z. That was my background, and it became uh, 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 local area networks uh, for my PhD and chip implementations of those. So from the early 70s we've got microprocessors, we've got a proliferation of what would be called microcomputers. They also have peripherals hanging off them and people are now in the early 70s thinking of how do we begin to link these things together in a cheap and practical way, not having to go through the local PTT, the telephone company and telephone wires and so on. So in Xerox, for instance, in Palo Alto, they're, they're working on what became the Ethernet, and in Cambridge, they're working on the Cambridge Ring. And there's a significant technical difference between the two of them, to say the least. The Cambridge Ring is not the group of people who um, were recruited by the Soviets in the 1930s, um, although if you Google Cambridge Ring, you'll find that as well. It was a very early local area network, and one of the characteristics that I'm um, struck by in terms of the architecture of the Cambridge Ring, and perhaps you can explain to me the background to this, is that how robust it really was from the word go. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, because the department had built a, you know, a SAC-1, a SAC-2, a CAP machine, um, uh, it had a tradition of building things that uh, uh, stood the test of time, uh, in other words, were useful to others and, and provided a platform, computing platform of some kind, so that was behind it. Um, there had been uh, a visit by Morris Wilkes to a company called Hassler in Switzerland, who had, I think, some telecoms background, who had also built a ring, a register insertion ring, as it was uh, called, as it's called. Uh, so there was uh, uh, some aspect uh, of that. Uh, but uh, there was innovation in the way the protocols worked, so it wasn't a robust in the PTT sense that it all had to really, really work and, and you know, uh, no uh, retransmissions were essentially envisioned, envisaged. It was more of a collapse if you had to retransmit. So the idea of packets and being able to retransmit and it's sufficiently reliable that you only retransmit occasionally and that's fine and you don't have to have heavy acknowledgements and all that sort of thing, which is part of the architecture, was also uh, what contributed uh, to the uh, robustness. But uh, you mentioned Xerox, again, on a lighter note, uh, as with uh, Manchester and Cambridge and others uh, on, on the you know, initial computers, uh, on local area networks, we knew each other. So I remember uh, going to Xerox Park, that must have been second or third year of my PhD, in other words, 1976, and they were very hospitable to me, but what they remember me for, in America of uh, the 70s, as now, land of cars, I cycled. So, uh, so I turned up uh, slightly sweaty, because it's up a hill, um, on a bicycle. 
saying, where do I put it? And, you know, I'm from Cambridge and I'm Andy and I remember to this day this sort of very positive but slightly bemused, uh, uh, you know, they remember me for that, not whatever I talked about uh, at, the, at the time. Uh, now it's a fantastic project, but again, looking back on it, the Cambridge Ring was nicely resourced at the university level because of the uh, capacity of the computer lab. In other words, uh, those engineers and technicians could build things and weren't trying to publish, uh, and having picked up experience on EDSAC 2 and some of them on EDSAC 1. Uh, that there was enough flexibility in the uh, way the academic system worked that you could essentially trade publication for construction uh, as the principal person, because the principal person published less in comparison to others. Uh, so it was well resourced, but still as compared to uh, uh, Xerox and uh, an industrial uh, position there, it was smaller. And then my PhD, I, I made one or two minor, well, you know, whatever, uh, uh, not major contributions to the design of the Cambridge Ring, but I did uh, 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 spend a lot of time uh, uh, on uh, a VLSI version, or a chip version of VLSI. It's slightly generous, but anyway. Um, and when I look back on it, uh, there was a funded project government funded here for doing a chip version of the uh, Cambridge Ring because it seemed you know, that this was in every way going to faster networks good, local area networks good uh, intellectual impact, financial commercial impact, you know, all that sort of stuff, technology, lovely, lovely but it paid for one person, me, literally one person, so the chip version of the Cambridge Ring was one person and or the chip version of the Ethernet was Intel Xerox and DEC. So this, now looking back, is barking mad. Uh, because uh, we did okay, but you know, it was uh, uh, not resourced properly. The ring, not, not the chip version, the ring itself was in its own way resourced okay. And it, and it's the uh, chip version, uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Now, I don't blame anybody for that. I just look back on it. I think, you know, I, I was, uh, we were all enthusiastic, ambitious, keen on it, uh, and naive as well. Uh, there was a fundamental myself, difference. I would, I would like to comment on my colleagues, but yeah. I was naive taking this on. Okay. But there were all sorts of corollaries which I can take you through, which are extremely positive, uh, which is essentially, this is the precursor to why ARM exists, uh, why the chip line in Cambridge uh, uh, exists in many different ways. But the precursor, and I mean the real precursor of why, you know, there was expertise starts with this particular project, even though the later things are of a different kind. There were fundamental architectural differences between the Cambridge Ring, which is called a token ring network, and uh, Ethernet. No, it's a slot, a slot ring. It's a slot ring. IBM is the token ring. Right. Cambridge Ring was a slot ring, um, and uh, they're different to the Ethernet, of course. You had something like 255 nodes on the Cambridge Ring, and each node could generate a packet, and that packet would be sent around the ring to a recipient. The recipient would unload the packet and then own that token and be able to put the packet back on loaded. Yeah. So it really had very consistent performance. Yeah, it was pretty good uh, from that point of view. So it was uh, a little bit towards the sort of synchronous behavior that you have in the PTT style networks. Uh, which existed at that time and continued to exist later. Um, and it had a certain fairness of access uh, uh, so that the, the, the slots or tokens, if you want to think of them as tokens, but there were multiple slots, so like it's a multiple token system rather than a single token system, um, uh, uh, allowed uh, arbitration, prioritization, and fair sharing uh, and, and allocation of bandwidth. Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a great design. and. Uh, uh, Morris uh, conceived it and David Wheeler designed it. But Ethernet was a device would look at the ri look at the uh, LAN and say, yeah, I've got a chance, I'll, I'll go in. And that's the fundamental difference between them. And the Ethernet could collapse disgracefully, as it's called, disgraceful yeah. degradation. It could just throw its arms up and say, oh, I can't do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So 
and looking back on it, these weren't sort of such constructive thoughts at the time. We thought we had a great design, it worked and so on. And the maintenance was, uh, the, my contribution was in the way the maintenance uh, uh, was done in some packets, well all packets were marked with some parity bits for maintenance purposes, so it was more robust uh, and, and, and things like that. Uh, uh, and the uh, degradation was bounded, in other words, uh, the uh, performance was a little bit too closer to the synchronous behavior than an Ethernet in comparison. Yes. Uh, it turns out uh, uh, that bounding was appropriate but not necessary, right? Uh, because today we use Skype or whatever, which uh, uh, is uh, you know, working with very unbounded uh, uh, network delays across the planet, and we still somehow put up with it. Uh, uh, both by put up with it in the positive sense, compensate for it using technology buffering and all the rest of it, and put up for it somehow socially we accept that it's gone uh, 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 and you can't hear what's going on, which a bellhead, in other words, a person from the PTT world would never, never, never allow, so that's impossible, that's a sin. So the idea of, um, of token passing was picked up by IBM, IBM Zurich Laboratory, yeah. Um, IBM eventually in 1985 actually launched a product um, 10 years after the Xerox patents uh, it looked as if with the IBM then behind it and it being more robust token ring would be it but actually Ethernet was it yeah, Ethernet was what it do you learn from that well I learned from that that no matter what it is give it a good brand because call it Ethernet even if it isn't Ethernet <laughs> underneath because what we have today as Ethernet is miles away from all that, uh, and sort of the standardization on the one hand, and the power of the marketing, and I don't mean in a cheapskate sense, I mean the assertion of an industrial position, uh, win. And that was because Xerox and digital equipment and uh, Intel were behind this? Assert the industrial position in every way. Hard. Commercially, pricing, uh, um, marketing, uh, position papers, academic papers, assert, win. Have you applied that lesson? You bet, uh, but not, not, I learned from that one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so you get your PhD, you're now a doctor, um, you're in Cambridge, uh, you, you know all the crew at Cambridge, um, you've met Herman Hauser by now and you've met Chris Curry by now and you've seen interesting things going on in various places. What do you decide to do next? Well, I think I'm right in saying that I met Herman in a disco in Darwin College. And we started chatting because there wasn't much disco going on or whatever. Um, by then the Cambridge Ring was uh, being sold by three companies or about to be sold by three companies. Morris would hand out the drawings, I think it was for £10,000 as seen. Drawings as seen, non exclusive, they are copies, get on with it. That's what I call technology transfer. Cash in hand, good luck, non exclusivity, next. I love it. I wish it was like that today. Um, so Mar uh, Morris uh, Herman says to me, hey, why don't we start a company uh, and be another one selling the Cambridge Ring? So I said, all right, uh, let's do it. So we started a company uh, called Orbis. This is 1978, the time this you got your PhD? 77, 78, yeah, yep. that's right. I can't, you know, it was oh, fine, yeah. that, yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm working on the VLSI version, but this is selling the board version. Right. right? Which uh, Logic are also selling, Top Express is also selling, and one other, which I've forgotten. Uh, so we indeed uh, also pay our £10,000 <laughs> or whatever, I can't quite remember, it was a reasonable amount of money, uh, but it was as, you know, as like selling a car as seen, there we go. Um, we have our first employee who is Mike Muller, who is the CTO of Arm to this day, uh, and the only employment that man has had is Orbis, which was absorbed into Acorn, which spun out Arm, so he's never applied for a job after that first, well he didn't apply, we met in the Eagle in, uh, uh, in Cambridge, the Eagle pub on his, uh, uh, after his last exam, and I offered him a job, he said alright, and that's, that was it, he never applied for another job, and look what happened to him, fantastic man, great, uh, great person, 
Uh, anyway, so I, uh, we start Orbis uh, and we find a customer, namely what was then called ICI in Runcorn in Cheshire. I still remember to this day the markup on the hardware was 17 times. Uh, we had an early adopter who wanted to you know, show ICI how higher speed networks, local area networks at 10 megabits per second uh, could be used in their business. Uh, the order was with us. Uh, uh, worked like guts at uh, constructing this and delivering it and all the rest of it. Uh, of course, there was a story that, uh, uh, you know, as best as we could, that there was a chip, chip version coming, so there was uh, a pathway into the future, and it, uh, uh, and it worked uh, well in the sense that there was enough money in the company then to, to operate, right? Was that first order was good enough to... Um, to, cause, like, we funded it ourselves but with modest money we just got that all there and, and off we went and we said manna from heaven the company's got going right. uh, so that was how uh, so meeting Herman by chance uh, getting on very well and him uh, uh, nudging me into starting a company because it, it came from his uh, side it wasn't me that I was being entrepreneur I was running around trying to make this chip work right or design it and so on I can, I can take you through those scars uh, it was, it was a challenge, to say the least. Um, you know, but, the, but a good one, you know, it, it in many ways turned out very well. Um, and we start this company, and at the same time, uh, CPU, Cambridge Processing Unit, is, has also just got going, uh, I can't remember, a few months earlier, which had been started by Herman and Chris Curry. And then, not too long after, CPU stops being a consultancy doing fruit machine uh, uh, digital uh, replacements and upgrades. Um, starts getting into uh, uh, home computing. Um, the Atom, well, actually, there's a series one, even one before that, a little board uh, thing. Um, and it becomes obvious that this net networking business is important in, in the general because we, you know file so uh, you know all, all the sort of networking distributed system stuff is happening there and I'm doing a particular bit but many others are doing many other bits so we decide that uh, it's probably better to uh, discontinue to, to absorb uh, 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 Orbis into CPU Acorn was always a sort of trading brand name so CPU was the underlying company I become the third director and shareholder of CPU in return for my uh, shareholding in um, Orbis. Uh, so Herman and Chris are directors. I become the third director. So I wasn't there right at the beginning, but I was, uh, you know, uh, uh, fairly quickly afterwards. Albeit Orbis was there more or less right at the beginning, uh, meaning when CPU started around, around about that sort of time. Uh, and we discontinue, meaning uh, we deliver our Cambridge Ring uh, thing, and we start those activities in, Acorn, in uh, CPU, in other words, Acorn, which became the Econet ultimately. So we decided to do uh, a networking system for the low-end computers, uh, and uh, that was one of my contributions to uh, CPU slash Acorn, uh, to provide a networking system which was actually more of an Ethernet type as it, as it happened. And here you are, 25. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I was a research assistant for two years doing the, uh, uh, the CHIP project. Uh, uh, got my PhD, two years postdoc with money I had found, actually. So, so the money for the CHIP I had found. Uh, 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 but I couldn't be my own principal investigator to use sort of university speak. So Morris was the principal investigator. Uh, the money came from the Rutherford Labs, a man called David Thomas, uh, who was head of a particular division of Rutherford Labs, took a shine to this stuff uh, and decided, oh, the UK needs this, I'll fund this particular thing. So that's where the money came from. So for two years I was doing that. Orbis became Acorn, was absorbed into CPU slash Acorn. And uh, I am uh, 25... 26, and after two years of the postdoc, I become an assistant lecturer. In other words, at that time, there was a five-year 
fixed-term lecturing post called assistant lecturer. So I joined the computer lab faculty as an assistant lecturer in the normal sort of way. So we're in the late 70s now. You're, um, now you're part of this uh, ACON operation. Um, ACON goes and gets the BBC Micro, um, and things are looking um, quite amazing. And inside, there's a little project deep inside ACORN by some of the engineers who are looking what's beyond the uh, BBC Micro. Oh, we don't like the processes that are on offer. Oh, could we do our own? Oh, yes, we do. And they therefore build a small risk processor, Stephen Ferber and others. And therefore, we have the beginnings of ARM. And things fall apart for poor old Acorn. And Olivetti, Italian company, then having made millions and millions through its IBM compatible PCs, uh, biggest European PC maker, um, decides to scoop up um, Acorn and buy it, and therefore scoops up um, your talent and the talent of Herman Hauser and the, term, yeah. the talent of Chris Curry. Then they decide that here's a man in Herman Hauser who can really lead some research. He's good at this. He's good at putting these teams together. And he sets up a lab, and he appoints you as the head of it. How old were you when that happened? Uh, 30 or something like that. But let me just give you a little more subtlety to what you've just, the sequence you've just uh, said. Yeah. So first of all, uh, at that time when it was still the BBC Micro, the interface between the university uh, department and the company is fantastic. There's flow both ways. There isn't, there aren't any barriers. So the whole notion, not just in terms of people, but the notion of doing a, uh, a networking system for the BBC Micro is very much inspired by the work in the university. Personnel change. And perhaps in retrospect, more importantly, the idea of doing chips for a small company like Acorn is in this earlier ring work. So we had a whole the university CAD system, a whole project for doing the chips and so on and so forth. And that becomes available, again, cash, uh, as a platform to this not so small but a smaller company. So the whole ability the capability to design chips which were crucial to the BBC Micro came from that pathway and actually also infected Sinclair because they did the, the Ferranti gate arrays independently but the reason they were doing it wasn't just pure magic but you know, it was a momentum in this case competitive in our case uh, symbiotic with the university it doesn't matter, there's a reason for this it's not magic uh, so we had learned on the Cambridge Ring chips how to do VLSI or chips and those uh, to use a slightly awkward modern word, those learnings uh, and experience, that confidence, that toolkit, those people with the ability to, to, to do it became available where within Acorn did the BBC uh, microchips, still using some consultants at the university and then went on to the uh, risk uh, uh, processor. But again, the risk processor. Here is uh, my recollection. I hope I've got this right. Why is it that this small company you know, was contemplating doing risk? Well, I remember the following uh, fairly well. Uh, through the university connection, I spotted uh, uh, and was interested uh, and spotted me in a more heavyweight way. Uh, people had heard of it. The risk project at Berkeley. And through my academic connections, I was a lecturer, uh, assistant lecturer, uh, I investigated, got some people to send me the papers and decided that this was actually something we could contemplate. So again, the, the, the feed into the company uh, wasn't sort of eureka moment, there were reasons. There was the ability to see the details of that project in Berkeley, in California, the ability to talk in effect to PhD students of mine and others to say, is this any good to get an assessment from there, from the US, not the PhD students, ex-PhD, you know, people over there, a man called Carl Deller, I'm thinking of in particular. 
bringing those papers to the attention of Herman, who is of course sucker for this sort of stuff, so he says, yeah, love it, let's do it, right? Bringing them to the attention, and I mean in the heavyweight sense, in the, in the provocative sense, not that they would have been aware of them, but, but yeah, could we do this to Steve Ferber and others? Um, and, and then getting on the hook. So now you see the combination, yes. the, the cad and so on and so forth. So then uh, uh, Akon does. Now you say, Akon sort of, fa- I don't, you know, of course I'm one of those who doesn't think of Akon as failing, because I think Akon became armed, so that's a success. Uh, I managed, you know, somehow by magic to get myself an aeroplane and that stuff and get a runway on which at home and so on. So, you know, and many others did very well, uh, you know, out of that stuff. So I don't know how one uh, measures success, but I don't measure it that it has to be perfect at all times into the future uh, and any down is, is uh, 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 you know, oh, it's fair. No, no, I, I think that's nonsense. Uh, it did very well. It changed the country because it, uh, uh, if, you know, it hasn't been many Raspberry Pis replacing that uh, today. In fact, that the careers, the perception of the whole country through the BBC Micro changed the direction of this country. Fantastic. Made a pile of money for a pile of people, not just me and Herman and Curry, but, you know, Chris, but, you know, some others as well. And then, it's, yeah, we, we, we built too many, we're out of cash, elementary mistake, but, you know, we're not perfect. So, I, you know, I'm not defensive. I'm saying, hey, that's pretty good. And Herman uh, tried to sell the ARM project when it was in Acorn to all sorts of companies, Siemens, others, and nobody was interested, right? So, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, anyway. So, fool them, eh? Fool them. <laughs> fool them. But what I'm saying is that, so then uh, the spin-out happens of ARM, but before that, uh, 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 you know, Olivetti took the majority shareholding, you know, 76% initially, and then a bit more, uh, because we ran out of cash, so you know, no cash, no good, right? Um, and uh, uh, Herman becomes vice president of research in Olivetti and turns to me, uh, 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 you know, his colleague, buddy, and partner, uh, saying, Let's do something else. I said, Manna from heaven, bring it on, Herman, right? Love it. Okay. So it, on the 1st of, um, sorry, April the 26th, indeed, um, 1985, the first ARM chips came back and uh, were running beautifully and found out something amazing that they actually ran with almost no power at all. So they were just just in the right space for mobility to come along. And that's the year that your second co-founding company emerges in the world, 1985 Qdos, a CAD yeah, company, yeah, yeah. computer-aided design. What's this about? Qdos, quick design on silica. Qdos, quick ah. design on silica. Well, so uh, uh, the executive summary is we the company which did software for chip design and hardware prototyping using electron beam direct write on the Ferranti gate arrays that we had used uh, in the BBC Micro and earlier in the Cambridge Ring. Uh, we should have uh, concentrated on the CAD and we would have been called Cadence. But we did it. We concentrated on the CAD and the hardware too much and the prototyping uh, uh, was important because one got chips wrong and so the prototyping was important but the hardware effort, we built our own electron beam machines uh, uh, and there was a third uh, partner in that business it was me, Herman and uh, Harun Ahmed, Professor Harun Ahmed Professor of Microelectronics at uh, Cambridge who is the e-beam person well the e-beams were uh, fantastic but uh, the bespoke one at a time manufacturing, what today is called 3D printing, but you know, it's, those were different days. Uh, uh, and you could only cover the, the prototyping uh, stage of chips, uh, was uh, not enough of a business, but, but more important was the dominant part of what was happening. We should have dropped it, we did it. But we had the CAD position because of all the, again, precursor stuff, yeah. that there was. At that time, the, the, the major CAD companies were establishing themselves, and uh, you know, there's a miss for us. Should had we started that as a or stop the hardware side, just concentrate on the CAD, we would have been tremendous. But that companies, you know, uh, uh, none of my companies have disappeared. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we, we've got uh, uh, 
Orbis, uh, my role in Acorn, and now Kudos. In their own way, they still continue. But that one joined uh, Plateau, and uh, perhaps uh, slightly unkindly, I might call it, joined the Living Dead. But by that, I mean it wasn't it was doing high tech, but it became actually part of Rutherford Labs and an e beam side prototyping okay. facility. And, and uh, it continued uh, until just a few years ago as an as a, uh, engineering centre uh, uh, under the label Kudos. Would you describe Olivetti um, Research Labs based in Cambridge, which eventually was taken over by AT&T, as a, as a success? Yeah, because uh, uh, for three reasons. One, it made money, uh, and it made money for the sponsors, and it made money for the became spin-outs uh, for the teams that made spin-outs and uh, uh, you know, reasonably big money. Uh, it was a fantastic environment which permitted in an innovation in a way that's not possible uh, in a university situation for all kinds of reasons and in many ways it's got worse today. Um, and uh, it uh, succeeded uh, because uh, uh, Olivetti understood very well how to leave uh, the local culture, in other words, do things in Cambridge the Cambridge way, not the Italian way. In Italy, the, the Italian way. So they provided the, the framework uh, which enabled it to uh, happen. So let's work back, backwards. So uh, I was, and never have been, a, so to speak, company, big company man. So when Ham and I were starting the Olivetti Lab, we said, right, let's have an independent company. I'll be, Andy will be the uh, managing director. We'll have a board. Uh, the company will be 100% owned by Olivetti, but all operational aspects are at the company level, not at the division or the business unit or the headquarters level. So that separation was very important. Olivetti said, great, get on there. So that means that operationally was total freedom, I mean, complete freedom what you pay, how you recruit, what the projects are, do you pay money, do you pay in Chelsea bonds, uh, what's the situation about simultaneous engagement uh, with university by individuals, so on and so forth. The closest we have today to that is uh, Google DeepMind, okay, where there's enough autonomy in a big company, but even they, they have more money in, in a bigger situation. Uh, but it's sort of similar. I'm a director of it, it's, I'm not an academic just having uh, some academic projects, there's a command line, there's money, there's power, there's, you know, so on and so forth. So, so Olivetti agreeing to all that and then being on the board as the control mechanism. Operationally, we jump and we serve as much as we can, but, but control-wise, you know, there is so on. So that led the freedom to, um, to innovate by using local talent and using the local power, which was the very thing that was the reason for arms starting in Acorn, right? And actually the BBC Micro and all that sort of stuff. So that's so it was a step and repeat, although they were all new people. I think only one person, Chris Turner, uh, transferred. So the recruitment was afresh. Uh, and uh, it went up to about 50, 60 people. Uh, 60 but the philosophy was the same, you're saying? Uh, totally the same. Right. Totally the same. Right. And, and it was the smartness of uh, Olivetti uh, to leave it alone, so to speak, or not to muck it up, or you know, whichever version you want to call it. They wanted money. So it's not Boy Scout stuff. But, but they said, listen, uh, you know, we understand. So, so that's one. And secondly, it's therefore hardly a surprise that you know, all sorts of interesting things uh, 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 came along. Uh, you know, those times, we, there wasn't too much multimedia streaming, audio and video streaming on networks, so we did all that, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, what became webcams, direct peripherals, as we call them on, on the internet. The internet, World Wide Web, anyway, came along uh, around then and so on and so forth. So we innovated in all kinds of uh, many, many, many ways. But here is the uh, uh, second part, which was crucial in order for my first comment, make lots of money, to actually be true. So the normal problem uh, for a research lab is that you do something and the business unit can't handle it because it's too innovative. And it might be too innovative for technical reasons and might be too innovative for business method reasons. It's a different business plan that's required to exploit the new thing than what, whatever the business plan, the business method, business model of the business unit in the large companies. So we ended up with the following model, business model, 
or how to do something about this innovation. And remember, the innovation is uh, command line innovation. It's wacky at the top. We'll try something crazy, something different. The unbelievable truth will happen. My God, it's a miracle if this turns out. But then we execute on it. We don't mess about, right? So we build prototypes. People are told what to do in an in a appropriate way, but we're on a mission, right? We're not on random writing papers. That's with your university hat on. And if you want to have a university hat on, by all means. So I wear my university hat when I'm writing papers, and I wear my, we're going to build a new wonderful thing using the power we've got, like teams and command lines and money and contractors and subcontractors in order to do this. So you end up, nevertheless, so you end up with something very practical. Here it is, my faster, better, cheaper, more new bar, whatever it is. And you actually show it to customers, meaning visitors, but actually customers for something else. And you look at them and they say, yeah, I'd like some of that. So you've got to feel that. Not only your gut feeling, but there's some external person. You're not trying to sell them. They're visitors, but they're customers of the company coming for a bit of a uh, you know, show business, uh, so to speak, in their research lab. But you look at them in the eye. Uh, and, and you listen to them, and, and you see they got little tickles, like that early adopter of that ring network in ICI. He had a little, little sparkle in his eye. You could tell, right? He was, he, was, uh, he was keen on it. He could see the business purpose in that company. So you, and then you think, okay, we'll reprioritize, change something. But then you know you've got something interesting mm-hmm. if you've got a look. So you go to the business unit, and almost always they say, very nice, but we can't handle it. It's great. We love it. We believe it. We would. Andy, you're great. Perfect. But sorry, I'm busy firefighting and so on. So occasionally you manage to transfer. And uh, most of the time you don't. And if you then try and do stuff for them, then you don't do the innovation. It's a cash 22. So this is what Olivetti said. Hey, listen. This is remarkable. This bit is remarkable. And it was driven actually by me and Herman. So they didn't say it. We proposed it to them. And uh, they said yes. We said, listen, unless we do something, things will end up in the rubbish bin. So let's spin out companies. Olivetti gets 20% of the spun out company. We, but it's actually me, Andy, in my private capacity, not as Olivetti man, but as Andy becomes a founder and finds the money, venture money, for this company. The team moves. They go from being research engineers to being gods and we see what happens and you can you already can have representation of the board because you got your actually 19.9% so you don't have to consolidate it so it's not visible to your you know, public shareholder base because who knows what will happen and off we go so and then actually there's a third bit and even then you have too many interesting things so then you open source so the third bit is and beyond spinning out companies, if you've still got live stuff, which you always do, and it's timely, you open source it to keep it alive, the person in it, because you're not, you know, the business units are not interested, you're busy in companies, you've still got something, you'll go in the bin, be forgotten, so you open source it just, just to keep it in some race or other, right? So that was, that's it. So we transferred a few things, but we spun out companies, uh, ATML, which became Virata, was one of them. Telemedia Systems Limited was another one. Uh, uh, Cambridge uh, Adaptive Broadband, which then became Cambridge Broadband Systems. Uh, and, but the role of the individuals is in their own capacity. So I am uh, chairman normally, uh, but there's an Andy, and there's another person representing the Olivetti shareholder. Right, right. right. So it's a remarkable thing. Just think about what I just said. It's, it's, I'm being paid a salary as director of research of, uh, of this lab, managed director, and yet I'm spinning out and becoming a founder and doing my bit for these companies. So uh, the biggest success was uh, uh, where we designed that ATM networks, actually rooted in the Cambridge Ring originally design. Uh, we spun out a company, a business unit wasn't interested, they wanted Ethernet. We spun out a company to commercialize ATM networks. That was a modest success. Funded by uh, American Venture Capital, we did a pivot, as it's called today, turned it into a DSL chip company, a Virata, with a market cap at its peak on NASDAQ of $5 billion. And not too much dilution in the meantime, so the Olivetti 20%, I can't remember what it was, maybe half that, you know, if they, I don't know if they sold, I presume they did, but, you know, paid for all the research funding for years, 
blah 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 right uh, so so that was the uh, uh, that was your number three your number four was IPV yeah so two that, years later yeah that still exists number five was ABL adaptive broadband two years later yeah that was bought by the customer at, at the get go so in other words I was finding the money and getting the venture and talking to potential customers and the customer like the man with the razor he bought the company right there and then um, CBL 2000 that was a spin out because having bought it right there and then we did our service for him like it was California Microwave the company and so the whole team walked and uh, walked, walked in a positive side. finished that moved on to the next one which is Cambridge Broadband Systems and then my, you had a rem remarkable year in 2003 three, sp three spin outs um, real VNC level five, yeah, and Ubisense, yeah. So, so here is the story. So AT and T bought Olivetti. So Olivetti, I have fantastic time for sympathies, but Olivetti were having their own troubles; couldn't fund the lab anymore. Um, so said to me, find a good home, try and sell it, but we'll keep on funding until you do. So I found AT&T and AT&T bought it and as it happens the budget for that nine months of funding while I found the purchaser uh, was less than the purchase price. In other words, they even made money on that. But do you see what I mean? It's, it's, it, it, but they, more importantly, they left it in good heart. AT&T takes over and we, 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 we are left alone in some appropriate way. Uh, and we decide to design a better telephone, big cheeky little buggers, right? A better telephone. So uh, this is my biggest miss ever, ever, ever. But we can come back to that. So we, we do the projects, but now we're in a, the opposite culture of Olivetti. So we're at and I go every other Friday to head office in New Jersey just to have some presence and try and deal with this much larger uh, company. Uh, and about how to commercialize, how to get impact and all this sort of stuff and, and in a way they bought us for that reason. But the culture was the opposite of Olivetti, it was monolithic, was difficult, but for many, for three years they gave us uh, fantastic support. But then sadly one day I get a call and they say, we're going to shut you, just like that. We're shutting. In fact, we've already written you off. You will now make yourself and everybody redundant. So, because they bought the company, so I'm the CEO of the company that they are. So I go, oh dear, that's not very good. Uh, and it was just around 9/11, uh, so I couldn't get on a plane. There were no airplanes, so I couldn't go to the office and headbutt or whatever. And normally you'd go to your board, but as part of the restructuring, and on my board I had the COO of at and I had the chief scientist of at and all these grandees, they were all made redundant as well. I mean, there was a real clean-up, American clean-up. So what do I do? Uh, I, uh, I get on the war path, so I, there's a war going on, one of the you know, Iraq wars going on. So I phone up uh, the ambassador who I knew, US ambassador, saying things like, why is America trashing a jewel in the UK when we're, you know, so I, I start doing effervescent things, potentially dismissible things from it, because I'm still an employee, supposed to be the redundancy, you know? I'm going to war here. I go to the House of MP, up the line, up to the House of Lords saying, why don't you do some political thing, and so on. So House of Lords, uh, the, the, this, uh, not the Secretary of State, but it was you know, one of the ministers, uh, yeah, saying, but, but basically uh, nothing can be done. So I find two people to buy the land even though they said you're shutting down, namely BT and Intel. I said, no, you're shutting, right? you're dead. Go to hell, we're not interested. I know we've got, you've got two customers, no, no, I don't want to be on something. It's a terrible situation, right? Worst moments of my life, I tell you. Because the lab is going great, guys. In fact, it's actually just about to miss the iPhone, because we did the iPhone before the iPhone, which is the world's most profitable, profitable product ever. And, the, and, you know, they're shouting the frigging lab, right? I mean, it's nuts. We didn't know it was going to be, but, you know, there was, there was stuff available. You know, a bit of jinking and funking around, and there would have been value there big time. Because, you know, we were pretty experienced about this, how to do all this stuff by then. And the chances are, you know, if you're experienced, you've got the talent, 
you got the business method, you know, things do happen. It's not magic. It's, it's you know. So these companies uh, are the startups as a consequence of the lab being trashed because the teams were strong. There was no IP exchange. Everybody, because they wanted again to license IP uh, at a, some future price to be negotiated in the future. Well, you can't have your cake and eat it and mug and everything else. So we said, go to hell. Uh, we're going to start independently. So in my case, uh, Real VNC, Ubisense, uh, and SolarFlare, uh, now called SolarFlare, at the time it was called Level 5 Networks, uh, are the ones I co-found with the teams uh, that were the actual teams in, in the lab. Yeah. Uh, what I did manage to do uh, is, uh, uh, and in some sense, uh, this uh, a positive thing about at and I beat them up enough that they gave very generous redundancy packages so that everybody was set up for six months, nine months, 12 months of redundancy pay to, to be able to do this, right? And equipment. So basically we could, literally, I kid you not, because technically, uh, uh, you know, the, the computers and all that were written off, had to go in the skip. Well, they went in the skip and five minutes later, somebody got to the skip and <laughs> took it out. I mean, literally that's what happened, right? But it was understood, it wasn't, it wasn't you know. So, so the equipment was available and the normal redundancy packages, which were, at, uh, well, I, I made them feel so bad ultimately that even though they, you know, they ended up paying up in the redundancy a modest amount of money, more than they might have done rather than the normal sort of brutal American thing. Um, so we were set up with enough money to get the prototypes going, no IP, so we had to start from scratch in all these companies and there are others as well. Um, so you've got to be uh, prudent in the sense of establishing your new IP and logging that is not the old stuff and so on and so forth. But yeah, those companies started because there was tremendous value on the table, right? Uh, and so what's this, what the big surprise? There was the innovation culture in that uh, lab because of the business method I described. Um, uh, and so these teams went, oh, well, I'm going to carry on. And they're together to this day, right? So you decided to go back into academia. I never left. You never really left. I was always simultaneously doing academia. So right. I, I went up to, so we haven't talked about that, but I, you know, I've always had a normal academic job with normal load, normal everything. So this is all, so one of the things to understand that I promulgate around the Royal Society and elsewhere that uh, the best technology transfer is when somebody does simultaneous uh, career and then they just talk to themselves, right? So I had the good fortune of simultaneously having an industrial career and you know I used to have PhD students with my academic hat give lectures all that sort of stuff but again the industrial side whether the research lab or my company has understood that has actually value added so gave space for that. What's the biggest mistakes you've ever made? Uh, mistakes? Uh, the uh, biggest miss is the iPhone so we prototyped uh, at and bought us, we thought, let's design a better telephone. That's a slightly uh, satirical way of saying we're networking systems people, not bellheads, but netheads, uh, IP protocol, you know, all this sort of stuff. And we designed something that was based on uh, an iPack, which was a little uh, HP um, uh, handheld with a Wi-Fi network, but with a uh, touch screen uh, or pen screen. Uh, where we prototyped uh, what today are called apps, uh, and they literally look exactly the same, the layout's the same, and so on and so forth, which were triggered by, you know, by tapping, which then we call them uh, snacks, web snacks, but now they're called apps. So, the, and I, I remember trying to say to at and look, we ought to set up a development unit in Cambridge, we ought to do this, we've got something interesting here, not quite sure what it is, and so on, but fell on death, uh, fell on deaf ears. So that was a mess because the iPhone and its ecosystem is the world's most profitable product ever. So, you know, having missed that, uh, I'm quite pleased that I had the miss, but it would have been better to have had a hit, right? Uh, so that was, uh, I, I don't think I've made any mistakes, but uh, again, people, I don't know if this will be interesting to whoever listens to this uh, piece, but you can't have your cake and eat it. So, uh, by combining academia with industry, you can't have the top position on both sides. It just doesn't work like that. Because on the industrial side, 
unless you go with a company, you're going to lose your shirt at some point uh, as an academic. So I've lost my shirt more often than I would have done if I'd gone with any of these companies. I would have been in a principal position in them. So whether it's the original A composition, I was the third schmuck doing the university as well. It had a lot of benefits. I'm not regretting, but there's a price. My point is, there's a price to be paid. Or as a founder of these companies, when you have some kind of hiccup three years in, as an academic doing it part time, you don't have a negotiating position, so you lose your shirt. Whereas the people who are in the company don't lose their shirts, and the principles are still there. With some of these things, I get on. With others, I lost my shirt, and uh, we don't get on because the not, not with a team. We, all, we still have reunions, right, to this day, uh, in the Castle Pub in Cambridge, of the, the people in these different companies getting together, doing sort of nostalgia. It's the shareholder, the new shareholders, that you you have a, a problem with. You lose your shirt with, and sometimes it's okay. So, in case of Solar Flare, uh, which was level five networks, well, they've put in three hundred million dollars into that company by now, so I don't feel too upset to lose my shirt. And so I still go and they invite me to their board dinners occasionally and stuff like that. That's okay. And I was chairman for many, many years. In other situations, Ubisense, which is a fantastic company, um, uh, I, 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 I'm not quite sure I'm in the same place as the new shareholders and therefore it's a little more distant, even though um, uh, the team, uh, Andy Ward, in that particular company, who is the CTO, my former PhD student, elected to the Royal Academy of Engineering uh, just recently. So, uh, uh, you know, we get on. Uh, Are you slowing down? <coughs> uh, uh, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Uh, what I must tell you is that this Royal Society lock is uh, uh, a very enjoyable, uh, good one. So I'm not at all slowing down on that one. And the reason is because this is a very traditional uh, entity, uh, a fine entity, and. Uh, even 10 years ago, I became a fellow in 2006, that was a little bit of a surprise. My PhD supervisor, David Wheeler, hardly published at all, he only had six PhD students, the man's brilliant, a genius, looked after me, mentored me, fantastic, I have a tremendous debt of gratitude. He became a fellow at society in the early 80s, that was most extraordinary. I became a fellow in 2006, you mentioned Steve Ferber, he became a fellow in 2005, 2004. That was a little less extraordinary, but uh, still a bit on the extraordinary side. In other words, we don't fit the template of the kind of person you'd expect here. Today, they can't have enough of us. So I'm finding that the door is so wide open, being treasurer, of course, is very interesting in its own right. But being able to be effective, not having electric fences around me or barriers or whatever, is very appealing. So I'm not slowing down because I found a situation where I can be effective in my own way uh, without having to do politics or, you know, all that sort of stuff. And what of this work done by Steve Ferber on the Royal Society's shutdown or restart report? Was that a success? Yeah, no, the, 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 there are various reports that the Society uh, is doing on the digital stuff, whether it's on... Uh, uh, teaching computer science, uh, whether it's on machine intelligence, whether it's on cyber security. Uh, the bosom here loves it all. I mean, it's gone from, uh, I said, David Wheeler extra and Morris Wilkes in his own way, but he was head of a unit and, you know, uh, uh, part of, the, you might say, the establishment in his own way, slightly more traditional man. I can see that and published and so on. Wheeler was very unusual. Ferber and, and myself were uh, less unusual. And then all these reports, all this stuff, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's all being almost too well received. I mean, you know, it's, it's almost too fashionable to be able to do that. Anyway, uh, these reports have their effect, and uh, I'm very, so I'm not slowing down because I've got something to do, as my wife tells me. More co-founding? Possibly. I mean, the thing that uh, you might be interested in is, is the following. When I became head of department in 2004 of the computer lab, now called the Department of Computer Science and Technology, I decided not to participate in any company that was going to spin out of the department because I felt there's a conflict between being head of an institution, it's not like being CEO in a company, that's different, head of an institution, which is an academic institution, and participating, you know, mentoring, looking at promotions, 
uh, choosing what direction the next lecture will be, doing merit payments, doing my own research, all that stuff, and participating in companies that are the fruits of that. So I decided not to do it. Hence, it all stopped at 2004 for that uh, reason. I, there was one that was started, but it was completely text easy. It was completely independent of, uh, of the university situation, so that was okay. Um, and we shut that one down. There was a company in Kenya, and it was too difficult operating a company in Kenya, so we shut it down. Maybe it's time will come. It was a, a, a messaging company. Um, was that pretext? Text easy. Yeah. 2013. Yeah. So, but that was not to do with the yeah, yeah. Uh, But I did go for a volume strategy, uh, very unusually uh, in the university system, a volume, get as many companies started as possible and wish them well and support them in every possible way. Don't take any financial participation and, and, and so on, but get them out. And in order to do that, set up a business club uh, around uh, uh, the department. Uh, so this is different to the technology transfer offices. This is this is our own thing. It's called the computer lab. Ring, you'll be pleased to know. Morris Wood suggested that thing, but this room refers to the networking group. But it's a business club. So there are mentors. There are people who have huge amounts of money as investors. There are companies who have done well, less well, and so on. And you join that, but you have to have been through the computer lab. Otherwise, you're outside. So people will return your call. Is what it boils down to you're part of that. So and get as many out as possible uh, by minimizing barriers, not by pushing them out, by just saying, you know, if you're starting a company in the department, you can do it, you can have an office, no charge, just get on with it. Here is some free mentoring from me. I don't participate, so I can give you a reading on uh, 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 this money or that money or this IP position or whatever it is, uh, but, you know, I'm not involved most technology transfer officers are involved in the sense that they have to make money for themselves, so that they're, they're conflicted and so on. And I must say I'm very proud and pleased that uh, this has worked extraordinarily well because uh, there are now, and, and we keep a list and we keep this up to date as best as we can, there are just over 260 companies, 260, right? So this is the biggest thing in Cambridge as a house of innovation of all. Half of them are still going. If you include ARM, which you know, backdates to that, but there are many others, like Improbable, whatever, uh, uh, you know, the volume of uh, about 18% have been sold for a total of just over $40 billion, right? The turnover is a billion, right? So this is heavy duty, heavy duty. Most people don't even realize it because it's not the, you know, Stereotype: Oh, somebody did some research. We went through a technology transfer office. Uh, you know, some company was formed. Apparently, that's a success. Well, it is in its own way, but it underplays. It's not what really happens. The most important thing walks out on its own two feet, starts something, and you can't. In my experience, and I'm not exactly or Herman's, not exactly naive on this. We can't predict which one's going to be successful. So there's no good picking winners. Get them out, right? So that's what I've been doing. But that's the reason that only one has been started. I've had plenty of opportunities, but as a, as a matter of decision, I've decided to do something else. Uh, and it's worked, uh, but of course, had I had the opposite uh, view take participating some, the volume would have been smaller, but I would have had a participation or whatever uh, in, in some of them. And I don't even join advisory boards, right? So I don't do advisory boards, I don't do, you know, shareholding chairman, director or founder out of that. I've left it alone. So it's slightly bizarre. It's sort of back to front, but there it is. And people have criticised Cambridge because it's only produced two billion dollar companies, um, arm and um, autonomy. And in fact, if they look a bit below the surface, um, they'll find they'll find a lot more activity. You bet. You bet. It's a very superficial view, and uh, that's a separate conversation. Anyway, but on the, on the founding, that's that's the reason you ask. Now, I might do it. I might not do it. I'm 65, uh, I can see plenty of opportunities and my research, because my academic research has always been of the kind that uh, there is some story you can always tell about how this could be used in practice, commercially or not commercially, but you know, has, you know it's the original Morris Wilkes thing, right? I just, I just step and repeat exactly that and I've done it to this day. Uh, so, so I've got opportunities of the research I'm doing, but uh, 
uh, it's to do with blockchain, to do with audit trails in big data, it's that sort of stuff at systems level, prototype stuff like that. But in my own research beyond that, I, I've concentrated on uh, sustainability of the planet and how computer technologies can be used to help. So it's been a little more distant from the uh, uh, immediate startup, although as I say, actually, even with that perspective, there are things that come along. So I don't know, maybe. I'm concentrating on Royal Society at the moment. Thank you for your, for your contribution to the archives, uh, Dr. Professor Andy Hopper, CBE.